Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for today. Happy New Year, everyone. Is God good or what? All the time. You know, I shared a little testimony earlier today, and I didn't give you the full spectrum of it. Uh, because uh, normally I spend New Year's Eve with family in the house, and we celebrate it this way. And, and this time around, it was just a different uh, venue. <laughs> One of uh, Jay's friends, who was a performer, had a, a special... Um, you know, offer in the room that was given to us to be able to go and celebrate. And it had the big screen TV. It has all of that. And these are all these artists, just a few of our friend artists and our family were there to see this venue, this just to spend, you know, the new year there. And as I'm there, for some reason, I don't know why, I felt sort of, you know, uh, I'm going outside of my uh, environment, sort of, I'm not going to be home. I'm not, you know, I felt like a little free. I said, you know, I don't have to worry about nothing. I could just be... I'm always just me. It's not like I was doing anything wrong, but I'm just in this place. And, and all of a sudden, the hostess, the, you know, uh, her name is Trina, comes to me. And, and she, I see her coming to me, and she says to me, well, you know, if I ask you a favor, would you be able to pray for the venue? And I'm over here saying, you know, I'm free. I don't have to worry about trying to do anything, you know, spiritually or trying to sort of pray for anyone. And goes to show you that God knows where you're at all the time. You know, he knows everything about detail. He knows what you're thinking. And I'm here thinking, you know, okay, this is just me chilling out, relaxing. And here it is. Can you? And God is reminding me in that moment, you're the church. Wherever you go. And on top of that, then all of a sudden I had another guy come to me and we start talking for who knows how long. So we're always in God's service, you know. But that's always good. And it's always a blessing. So let's just pray and thank God for that. Lord, we thank you for always being around, always watching over us. Even when we don't think you are around, Lord, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for guiding us and leading us and teaching us, Lord, uh, who you really are and what you have planned for us in this life. We thank you for your blessing of your word. You said that your word would not be returned void, that it would truly have power, power to transform power to heal, to restore, to make whole. We thank you for this opportunity right now to receive your blessing in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, amen, amen and amen. Well, we're going to start. I'm going to be talking to you about Jesus, a man on a mission. Now, when I was growing up, we heard Jesus only when people were going about to curse. You know, they would use Jesus in a derogatory sense, you know. And you know what I mean? Everybody knows what I mean by that? I don't want to have to repeat it because, you know, it would just be, you know. But they would just use it in a wrong way, you know, and it would be negative, you know. Like something happened, oh, and that, you know. And they, were, and they were always looking at it as just as a curse rather than a blessing, you know. And so when we're going to talk about Jesus, a man on a mission, I want you to know that uh, Jesus knew he, he was a man on a mission. He understood what he was called to do. And we're going to be talking about him a little bit today, so you understand. This is why we are known as Christians, because we are Jesus Christ is where we got the name Christian from. All right, so and it's, uh, we want to be able to understand what was taking place when we understand what God was trying to teach us. Now, there are scriptures I'm going to give you. If you have your apps, you can use them, and, and you can do that. But Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 it talks about a little about how the Spirit of the Lord, Jesus says in this particular scripture in verse 18 and 19, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. Jesus came to heal our land, to heal our people, and that means everyone. And he did when he walked the earth. He came fulfilling these good works. His, his, his calling, his mission was to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Fulfilling these good works was the mission he accepted to do. But here's the thing. He didn't intend to do these things alone. 
What do I mean by that? He did, came to heal everyone, set the captive free, to do all these miraculous things on the world, which he's doing even today, but he didn't mean it for him to do it alone. Read Matthew 18, chapter 4, verse 18 and 20. It tells you, as Jesus was walking aside, he started to pick up people who he was going to use to when he left behind to finish the work he started. And folks, if you don't know this, he's chosen you. Why don't you turn to someone and say, that means you. Jesus' mission was always meant to include his followers. Now, if you read in Leviticus 26, 2026, 20, it says, I am the Lord, the holy God. You have chosen. You have been chosen to be my people, and so you must be holy too. And I, I'm, I don't want to get into uh, that particular concept, but it's saying that you are his people. He chose you. Turn to someone. He said, she chose you. Make sure they know they hear that God chose them. They may not think that, you know, they have a plan. No one really chooses God. Turn to someone and says, God, no, no one really chooses God. He chooses you. All right? So let's just get that straight. Some people think that uh, it all comes down to me. No. If you're serving God and you find that, it's because he chose you. Believe me, he knows you by name. He knows every detail of your life. You did not choose me. It says in, in the, if you look at the book of John, chapter 15, verse 16. It says, you did not choose me. I chose you. And sent you out to produce fruit, the kind of fruit that will last. Now, he's talking about fruit. Now, there are a lot of things about fruit that you're going to learn. Because in, in John 15, 1, uh, in the Old Testament as well, it talks about a lot of grapes symbolizes uh, uh, Israel's fruitfulness in doing good, God's good work on earth. And there are a lot of scriptures I can give you. But also in that scripture, it says, you know, that, uh, in the process, the branches are, are those who claim to be followers. And he refers to this concept of branches of a tree to be followers of God. And then he uses the analogy that some branches have to be pruned so they can grow. But then some have to be cut off and thrown into the fire. He says those that don't produce good fruit are worthless. But God's plan is for us all to be fruitful. Now, when I was reading John 15, uh, John 15, verse 16, Jesus made the first choice to love, to die for us, to invite us to live with him forever and make the next, again, to maybe be able to make the next choice, to see what God can do when you turn your life over to him. When you say, Lord, show me what you mean by how am I supposed to do and follow in your footsteps. Now, we pray things, well, I'm not good enough, I'm not qualified enough, I can't do none of these things, and it has nothing to do with that. Because once you have been chosen, the Holy Spirit gives you the power to accomplish everything. John 14, 25 tells you, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus talking, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave not in the way the world gives it. He says, I'm going to give you a peace that even the world can't comprehend. You see, and so often we look at peace as absence of conflict, you know, and that's a world's view. But God's giving you a peace that totally surpasses your understanding of peace. And sometimes God wants to show you certain things. And today when we look at Jesus as the man on a mission, you see, I want you to know that everything God wants to do on this earth, heal deliver, set the people free. He is meant to be done in partnership with his followers. That means you and I. Turn to someone. That means you again. Before we are ready to fulfill his mission, we have to become unified. You see, but the problem with unification and unity, you know, there's, you know that is a little complicated. And, I, I, and, and we have to understand this because if we don't understand this complication, we, we take it to a whole different level, and it causes problems. I've been in a team all my life playing sports, even as a kid. Um, I was a baseball player. I was really, really good at it. It was naturally, I was naturally inclined to do it. 
And and I can tell you, I couldn't even hold the cho- amount of trophies I had as a kid. But anyway, I would win. Our team would go to the championship almost every year, but we would lose. What do you think happened with all the, the people on the team? They start to blame whose fault it was for not doing that. I mean, of course, I came out of it with the MVP and all these kind of different trophies that you win for being exceptional in these areas, but that wasn't enough for me. I wanted the championship with the team. And as I grew up, I was in the football team. I, went, I had scholarship for college, the same concept. But I would make it, and when I played football, I would go to the championship. We went to the championship five years in a row and lost five years in a row. I was like, what? Again, you could be exceptional as an individual, but if the team doesn't win, it means nothing. I can tell you that. I never held on to any of the trophies because they didn't mean nothing if you don't have a team effort. But so I, in a lot of ways, I used to love developing people to, be, to exceed. So I started to help kids develop, work as a team. And some of, my, some of the young adults that are not here, used to, I used to pick the youngest, the, the, the most unqualified kid to play, unhealthy, they just didn't have it all together, and I would train them for like five, eight weeks, six to eight weeks. And I'm talking about young kids. Boys and girls. And then I would give them one, one task. I'm going to equip you to play. Some of them didn't even know how to catch a football. Some of them didn't know how to do nothing. And I would help them to say, keep in mind that you're going to play against one team that is far bigger, far better. And that was their goal. We're going to prepare to play that one team that is far bigger than you. Far better than you. And you're going to win. So I would train them. All the basic. And it was a matter of helping them understand what unity was about. And, I, and all the way through, I can just tell you about the last year. To be honest, they won six years. I mean, out of the seven years, they won six years straight. And I'm not talking about kids their age. I'm talking about kids far bigger than them. Matter of fact, the last year we won it, it was the kids. I used to do a program that was... Um, geared to sort of help them develop their artistic skills, like art projects and stuff like that, like making flashlights and stuff. And then the other part was the, the athletic part, tra- training them how to work together, how, how to teamwork and play. And one, that one last year, I had them, uh, it was pouring. And we were supposed to, after we finished our program, go out and play these kids on that. Now, this is, mind you, after the last six weeks, seven weeks of the program where we used the last one. And so the bigger kids, because it was raining, came to the place where we were, we would normally meet and have our program. And they started to mock the little kids, intimidating them. You know? And as we were walking towards the park, the older kids would pick on them, oh, slap them in the back of the head, you know, pull their hats, make fun of them. And the kids would come to me, uh, I don't think I want to play. And I would tell them, focus on what we learn and work together. Can you do that? Yeah. And I saw keep it in my family. Let me tell you, when they got to the park and they were playing these little kids, you had the bigger kids fighting each other because they didn't know how to stop these little kids. It was embarrassing to watch those big kids. Man, they were embarrassed. They started to fight among each other. And it wasn't just a, they beat them by a little. They destroyed them. The power of unity. God has created us to work together. In, in John chapter 15, verse 2 and 3, Jesus makes a distinction between this pruning and separating. Sometimes if you don't, get people who are not in the right track or on board can cause a lot of problems for everyone else. You know, I always look at the analogy of a ship. And when I look at the church, for example, some people will look at a boat like a cruise ship. And like people like being in a cruise ship because they can just lay back and chill out. But our ship is a battleship, folks. We are always at war. We are always taking, but everyone plays a different part in this battleship. You see, some man the deck. 
Some are out to help those that are, are dry on the water. They are those that sort of pray and down in, under the, in the engine, and they're, they're the one the prayer warriors. They're the one doing that. They're also those that man the cannons. There are different parts of who we are in Christ that our role is to play, but we are still unified. But you always find that in a ship you have someone who have their own opinion. You know, maybe we should do this. No, I think it's better to do this. No, I, mean, I don't like that. One time it was about uniform, right? You find someone says, well, I don't think we should wear uniform. And others say, no, I think we should wear uniform. No, maybe we should use this. Maybe we should do that. It starts with little tedious, dumb things like that. It doesn't take much to cause problems in the body of Christ especially. Fruit, according to the Bible in John 15, 5, is not limited to soul winning, folks. In that chapter, it talks about prayer, joy, love, and, it, uh, and they are mentioned many times throughout the scriptures. And I'm going to tell you about a prayer in a few minutes about that because I want to show you a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples as he is out. He has been out for three years with these disciples. They've been doing healing. They've been doing a miraculous thing. Now, none of you really experienced a miracle. Have you ever seen a miracle, anybody? I mean, serious miracles? Powerful to see it. You see? There is nothing like it. Now, I want you to keep in mind, for three years, Jesus created a community with these followers. They followed him. They seen him work. They seen him heal the blind. They even seen him raise the dead. They seen all these things. It's even in the book of Revelation when it comes, and even the devil's going to do that. And if you don't know the difference between Jesus and the devil, you're in trouble. You see? Because the devil's out to copy what God is doing so that if you don't have that relationship with him, you're going to go right back to what's exciting. But here it is. Jesus started with 12. A movement initiated by God, but completed by his followers. And that's what this is. A mission. God started it, and we are to finish it. And we need to be prepared for when he comes back because we have to give him an account. He tells us not to worry. Philippians 4, chapter 6 and 7, he says, don't be anxious about anything. He said, don't worry about nothing. He tells us, listen, if you trust that he is who say he is, then you have nothing to worry about. And believe me, we're going to be tested. If you're saying, I believe in him, I believe God is this, and then when it comes down to it and you get challenged and then you're going to be tested and then there's going to be problems because if you don't really believe in what you're saying, then you're going to be in trouble. Now, he designed followers who, ins who were inspired by him, who, uh, again, uh, united their gifts, their skills together. They went out and they, they, they broke bread together. The, the idea was great, but the implementation proved to be complicated. So he gave them everything they needed to do, he taught them by example. He didn't just tell them what to do. He was the example. So they were seeing him do it. And yet still, they had trouble. Not because God's idea was wrong. It was, it was, it was, a, and it was because it was a great idea. The problem is that the followers, the troops, the disciples get confused along the way. And a lot of times we get confused think you have it all together and things come up and it doesn't work out the way you have it planned and it happens. So today we're going to focus on understanding that Jesus was a man on a mission. But he was, his mission wasn't finished until you finished it. It was for us to finish. And we look at the battleship uh, uh, analogy and we see that everybody has a, a part to play in their and there are gifts that God has given you you're supposed to use. Now, there is a concern, however, regarding the disharmony of the crew. And so often this disharmony, when we first saw board the, and assumed the crew was made up of uh, others like that. We like the idea that we have people on the team, on our crew, have an understanding that God says, okay, we are on the same team. Everybody wants to play their own part, usually. 
usually God wants to pick the part that's meant for you. I want you to know something. God chose you for a reason. There are things you are supposed to do that no one else can, to be honest. Now, if you don't understand that about yourself, God says he chose you for a reason. If you're hearing the message, he says you are unique in the way he chose you. There are things that you are going to be able to do or are meant to do that no one else can. Imagine that. Just picture that in your head. Now, sometimes we struggle with insecurities and stuff like that, that we don't think we are capable of accomplishing anything like that. But listen, when God chose you to do something, nothing can stop him from completing that task in you. And I mean nothing. He would even use a trial to cause you to step up to the plate. That's right. If you know the story of Jonah, he was gifted to go speak God's word in one place and he didn't want to do it for whatever reason, angry, insecure, for whatever reason, try to go the other way and end up being in a boat in a storm, thrown in the water, swallowed by a fish, and then bloop, back to where he needed to be. God will find a place for you regardless. And if it would take a trial, a circumstance, a problem, in your life, to get you there, he's going to get you there. He'll use whatever it takes. You can run. You heard that phrase, right? You can run, but you can't. Sometimes the battles are fierce. But the boat that God has you in is safe. You're safe in God's hands, folks. You're safe in God's ship. There is a concern, however, regarding this. The psalmist, like I said, assume the crew was made of people like us. And we like the idea of people, you know, like us, you know. They have the same understanding, you see. But sometimes God puts people together that have, don't have that. Well, how does that work then? Well, stick to the plan of what you are gifted to do. Do your part. Don't look at anybody else's part. Do what you're responsible for. And so often when we want to do someone else's part, we cause a problem. You see? I had to give you an example. We were playing in a game, and so far everyone's doing their part. We've won every game. It's the same team. We, we, we had it all together. One guy decides, uh, he decides that he wants it more than everybody else. So they've been winning. We were winning, getting things done because everybody was doing their part. This individual, towards the end, decides... I don't see that guy doing what he's supposed to do. And he goes and tries to do that guy's part, which happens, what happens then? Now, if we let God allow us to sort of see things through his eyes and his leading, we'll get it done. You don't need to panic. You don't need to worry. You don't need to try to take matters into your own hands. All you need to do is trust. How many can do that? How many you can trust? Now, there are the other regiments deeply devoted to prayer. There are people who are just know how to do that. Some of us have a hard time with prayer, but it doesn't mean you can't do it, folks. But Jesus was an example of what prayer was like and how effective it was. Some things that we have to learn and we can actually still do, even though you don't feel that you're qualified to do it. The thing that we have to remember is the consequences is rocking the boat. There's trouble on deck. Fights have broken out. And usually when this starts to happen, you know, when we won, four, the four, four went to the championship four times. On the fifth time, we defeated ourselves because everybody was fighting already before we even got on the, on the field. What were they fighting about? Give me an idea what they think they were fighting about. You, you went to the championship four years in a row, and here you are at the, the championship for the fifth time, what do you think they were fighting about? Any idea? You're not doing your job. You got to do this. Reminding them of that past or the stuff when they should have just stick focused on what their mission was. And so often we lose sight of that. Now, there's always going to be adversity and fights and problems. So here we are. Now we're going to get into Jesus on the man on a mission. He taught us. As he was in John, now you can turn your Bibles now to John 17 and 
verse 20. And this is important because I want you guys to read this. Uh, I'm going to put it on my app on my phone. Um, so in case if somebody has it, they can actually read it. John chapter 17, verse 20. And Jesus is praying. Now here Jesus is about to go and ascend to heaven after being with the disciple for three years. And he's equipped them with everything they needed. And he's about, he's about to, you know, ascend, right? And he's praying for them. What is he praying for? What do you think he's praying for? Now, I don't have to tell you to guess. Uh, to guess. You can actually read it. What is he asking them to pray? What is he praying? He said, I pray for these followers, but I am also praying for all of those who believe in me because of my teaching." Then he's praying, Father, I pray, I pray that they can be what? One. What does that mean to you? United. Right? Then he says, then the world will believe that you sent me. How is them being one going to force the world to believe who he really is and say he is? I want you to think about that a minute. I want you to just, you know, Take it and just let me just keep giving it to you. I want you to process this because he says to you, and then one says, you are, and then he tells them, I pray that they can be one. As you are in me, I am in you. I pray that they can also be one in us. Then the world will believe that you sent me. Listen to that phrase, and this is Jesus praying for, because he's about to leave them, and he's telling them, I'm leaving you behind to finish a job. But know that in the same way the Father was with me, what did the Father do with Jesus when he walked the earth? What did Jesus do? He healed the blind. He did all kinds of miracles. Everyone they didn't even realize. They were just like in awe of what he's done. And so he's telling them, listen. Now Jesus prayed for all who followed him, not just specific people. He says all who followed him, including you and others you know. So it's not just limited to just certain people. He wants everyone to get this. He prayed for unity, which is in verse 11, if you read it there. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, he tells them. But they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Now Jesus is talking to the Father. He says, Lord... Father, I am about to go to you, but I'm leaving them. So as I leave, as the same way you're with me, I want you to be with them. So he's here with you, giving you the same power and authority he gave Jesus when he walked the earth. He's giving it to you and I. What well, becomes the problem with that now? If we don't know the Father, we don't know the Son, how are we going to know the, the Father? What is it going to take? So he's praying. How precious are these words? Jesus, knowing the end is near, prays one final time for his followers. And again, striking. Isn't, isn't it that he prayed for, he could have prayed for a lot of things. Tell me, what kind of things he could have prayed for? Fire from heaven, okay. That's good. What else can he have prayed for the disciples? If you're going to pray for someone here, what would you pray for? Good health. That's it? That's all I'm going to get from you guys? Favor. Well, favor, favor protection. protection. Anything else? Family, Family yes. What else can you pray for? Faith, Faith right? Unity. Unity. Automatic power. Give me the power to heal the sick, the blind. You can probably pray for anything. But Jesus prayed for one thing. He could have prayed, give them insight, give them wisdom, let them be really smart. You know, he could have prayed, let them be really gifted in a certain way where the world can see the creativity. Let them be able to sing like the angels, you know. He could have prayed anything at this point, but he prayed for unity. See? God gave you an opportunity, you know, the, the rubbing of the lamp and the genie comes out and you have three wishes, Right? You know, the first thing people want to wish for is what? More wishes. 
You know, like three is not enough. Right? Or then we go into the materialistic stuff. Like that's going to save you. Had a conversation that same night in the New Year's Eve with this young man. And, you know, he's excited about the job he's doing. He likes it. He seems like it's him. And I'm, as I'm talking to him, he's, he's really into it. He says, you know, I can see, I can see he's, it's just, he's something he's meant to do, you know. But then he starts to say, you know, but I don't think it's enough. I think I just want some more. And I'm trying to tell him, listen, you can have the best job in the world, but it's still not going to satisfy you if you don't have that peace. If you don't have Jesus in you, folks, you can succeed no matter how high you succeed, you'll still be empty. I just see it. I've seen it with rich guys. Still looking for, trying to fulfill that because they don't. Now, Jesus was at the end and he's praying for them. He could pray for safety or happiness. And a lot of people who like happiness. But he prayed for unity. He prayed that they would love each other. As he, and as he prayed for them, he also prayed for those who will believe because they are of their teaching. Think about what he asked them to do. He says, I'm also going to pray for those that will believe when you talk to them. See? See, I'm going to pray for those. So you're talking to someone about the Lord as you're praying for them. God's blessing is going to fall on them because of that teaching. A gift. But if you don't talk to nobody... Who's going to hear and get and receive that blessing? Nobody. Hmm? That was me. When I first got saved and I was, I was in my last year of that championship game, uh, heading toward that last championship game. And had, of course, I had recently been saved. You know, I was, you know, I, I wasn't the type to talk to anybody anyway. You know, so I just kept it to myself. But God didn't have it. He started to cause a problem with the team, you see? And so, you know, because I was really, like, I was almost, like, checked out already, you know? And it seemed like I was just, you know, I found the Lord. I was different, hanging out with them. I wasn't cursing anymore. I wasn't doing the things I did before with these guys. And so I was just at this place ready to, you know, and, and they started to notice that I was different, right? So I wasn't going to say anything. I said, when this year is over and it's over, I'm just gone. You know, that was it. But God didn't have it that way. He started having guys question me. Yeah, one, one guy specifically, because they were complaining to him because we were the closest together. You know, we know each other from when we were kids. And so he would come, yo, Ben, yo, Ben, uh, what's up, man? Everybody's saying you're different. Put me in a position to actually speak, teach what I've learned. And he kept irking me about what's up, what's the difference, what's going on. And I told him, I'll tell you, let's, let's just go get a, I'll go to lunch after that and go get some pizza and I'll tell you. Because he kept, kept. I was the type of person, I wouldn't tell nobody nothing. i just keep it to myself. And he just kept, kept, and because everybody else was complaining. They were looking for a goat, someone to blame why we're not winning a championship game. But I went to the pizza shop, led him to the Lord. He took me home and I led his wife to the Lord. That's how it worked. And I didn't even know how to do that. God's gift. Get this essential point. I want you to get this because I want, you, I want us to really hear from John 17, 20. As he's saying that God has already, Jesus uh, is telling them what he's praying them for and that unity. He says, he prayed that they would each love one another. As he prayed for them, he also prayed for those who will be believed because of their teaching. That means us. In his last prayer, Jesus prayed that you and I be one. Now, as you get this essential point of our unity, unity has a great purpose, folks. The future growth of the kingdom depends on our unity. We have to hold each other. Well, before I tell you that, what is unity? Not rhetorical. What's unity? Uh, I like that. It is definitely power. How is it power? That's right. Two or more better than one in every aspect, right? In strength and physical, three chords together, 
It's, I mean, it says the more you have, and, and not only that it has power, but another, another idea of unity. Anybody else? That's right. You see, this harmony causes people to be unforgiving. And which causes, and the enemy's plan is always to bring division. You divide and conquer. And we, I mean, you could hear this in a square of God. You come to church, you hear it. You can read it in the word of God. But when it happens, you're still unforgiving. Heart in your heart. And you don't know how to humble yourself when you know that you let the enemy in. You can teach them, pray for them, do that, and people still have a choice to make those choices themselves. It's mind-boggling, but it's how it works. That means us, folks. Now, we need to grow the kingdom. And growing, the future growth of the kingdom is dependent on this unity. Unity matters to God. This unity disrupts him. And why? Why does it disrupt him? And why? Now, before I let you answer, so all people will know that you are my followers, disciples, if you love each other. That part comes in there. You can't say you love each other or, or, or do that if, you know, you don't follow through on what it says. You see? If you're going to say you love, you, you're, 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 in uni, you're unified with your brother and sister, and then you don't really love them, then that becomes a problem. Unity, now John, thir uh, turn to John 13, verse 35. Tells you unity. Tells you something about unity. It tells you unity creates belief. Tells you. It creates belief. How will the world believe that Jesus is real and that his followers are real? The one thing that con convinces people more than anything else is when we love one another how do we do that? Now, I, I love my favorite stories in the Bible comes with David and his mighty men. I love the way he did that. David was an outcast at that point of his life, running for his life because King Saul was chasing him to kill him. He did nothing wrong. He was just trying to honor God in the best way he could. And someone got jealous and, you know, they didn't want him. And he's running for his life. And he's running for his life. And who does God send to him? Now, you heard me say mighty men, but when those men came to him, all the outcasts came to him. All the people that didn't have nothing, no education, no nothing. They were people just like people on the street. Almost like you go out there and see the homeless, and God sends the homeless. And these ones become mighty men because of the unification. And these 300 and sometimes 700 men, they could have taken over any territory. As a matter of fact, the enemy hires them to fight their battles. Can you imagine that? Even the enemy find that because they were so unified, 300 can go and fight 10,000 and they will win. And have won. Just because of the unification. Jesus chooses 12. And some, even though there is one that sort of, he still chose him. I want you to keep that in mind because that's another story that we're going to get into. Because so often we have this idea in our own minds how we see things. And God says, I need you to see it through me, through my eyes, spiritual eyes. We need spiritual eyes to see what God is telling you. Don't listen to the way the world looks at it because if you do, you're going to distort what God is trying to do. How do we make every effort to keep the unity? Think about that a minute. How do we make every effort? You could only be responsible for you. Some people may not cooperate. Does that mean we compromise our convictions? No. Does that mean we can abandon the truth we cherish? No. But does it mean we look long and hard at the attitude we carry? It all comes down to here. How committed are you to the body? You see? Now, I've, I've learned this lesson many years. We've seen ministers who, amazing ministers in, 
and they sort of lose their way because it, it can get tiring sometimes because they don't see someone doing what they're supposed to do and it forces them to try to take matters into their own hands to fill that void. And sometimes we see people not doing what they're supposed to do or come and they're not, they volunteer but they don't show up because they're just volunteers and then all of a sudden it leaves the void. And usually a lot of times we try to make up for what they can't do and that could be dangerous. A lot of times, with jealousy uh, uh, and selfishness, are they are <clears throat> there will be confusion when there's jealousy and selfishness, and every kind of evil. James chapter three verse sixteen tells you that. He said, "Do you know where your fight and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that wage war within you." James four one. God wants us on mission, but to get there. We have to regularly clear out all the baggage. See, we got a lot of baggage that happens when uh, uh, groups of people regularly uh, interact with each other. We get together and all the stuff we carry, we bring into this thing. Now, keep in mind that God has a plan and a purpose for you. Turn to someone and say, God has a plan and a purpose for you. I'm going to read you a story of this woman. This older woman one day sat down to give her newly married daughter some advice. She said, just try to be nice to him. Smile when you see him coming. This is her advice to her newly married daughter. Right? And she smiled and, and when um, she just be, just uh, to be nice to him, you know. She smiled. Smile when you. She says, "Smile when you see him coming. Pay attention when he talks." And then he said, "She says, uh, uh, hold his hand when you can." And the daughter looked at her uh, at her like she had two heads, you know, <laughs> saying, "Mom, why wouldn't I be nice to him? You see how we are with each other." And the older woman said, uh, "Things will come between you two. Not necessarily bad things." Just things like jobs, kids, game practices, aging parents, and their needs. Everybody's schedule will just begin to crowd each other, each of you, you know. And she's telling them practical things. And they may come a day when you barely see each other. This is what happens in most marriages. She said most marriages die more from drift than adultery. That's a fact. I know you can't imagine it now, she tells her. Neither could I. But it happened to me and your father and so many other friends. We survived because someone had talked to me, uh, with me, when it seemed like the father or father and I were not just getting along. Didn't have things in common. We thought our natural attraction and affection would always keep our relationship smooth and effortless. And it does in the beginning, but it says three kids and years, and, and years later, marriage needs attention. If they're going to thr thrive, you have to be intentional about connecting, appreciating, and listening to each other. Effort, same thing we're going to need in our walk with God. Here's a point of this, the point of this wise woman's words. Everything needs attention. Turn to someone says, everything needs attention. Make sure they hear you. If it's going to thrive. Nothing relational stays on automatic pilot. And that's the problem with the believers. They want things to be on automatic. No effort. If you want to grow, if you want to be the man and woman on a mission, then we have to understand there are things we need to do. What does getting, giving attention to the church look like? There was a time when uh, the church loved each other and when they uh, did a huge outreach and evangelistic event, you know, you get them excited, you know, but sometimes it doesn't last. The Bible in Acts chapter 2, 42 and 47 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to breaking bread and to prayer. We're committed to do this. 
we need to be doing this together. We cannot break that because we need to continue to, as iron sharpens iron, we need to continue to do that. Now, when you play a sport, whatever sport it is, and you want to improve your game, do you play, play against people who don't play as good as you? No. Why not? Because you won't improve. You won't get challenged. See, you have to learn to take chances and grow. If you stay the same way, you're not going anywhere. Some people like playing against people who don't. They try to take advantage. They, again, it could be because of their insecurity, but it may not necessarily be the case. But they devoted themselves to being unified. All believers were together in everything. They had everything in common. How does the church continue to grow in a loving and loving one another? See, and not stay in this automatic pilot. And again, a lot of churches die and problems begin because they are on automatic pilot. And now we're trying to get to, and this is why crises and stuff comes up, because God says we need to be unified to work towards something. And that's when the church really thrives, when the problems come. See? So God allows the problems to help us grow. So here's a checkup question for us in the group uh, as a believers who are engaged with each other for years. We are in a honeymoon season where it's just effortless to love each other, listen to each other, and be around each other, and we've begun to drift away from each other. And that happens just like you're not even aware that this happens, by the way. You just start to feel something that's not there. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not getting fed enough. There's Bible studies, there are classes, there are prayer groups, there's everything that you can do, but no, we're just getting bored because you're not, they ain't automatic pilot, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And then they want to see them grow. So they think, oh, so we'll go somewhere else because that is going to make a difference. Same automatic pilot. Jesus would regularly take his disciples away from the daily to do lists of their just get along with each other. Now, they would fight with each other. There were fights among the, with the disciples. There were arguments that took place there. That's just the way it is with human nature. And, you know, he didn't, you know, sometimes he had to sort of reprimand them. Mother Teresa said, we can't all do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Let's focus on what small things can do to love your community more, folks. Remember the Acts 2 community and what it means. But if you are going through adversity, I'm going to give you four points of adversity right now as we close. It says that growth happens when we respond to adversity in four ways. And what I just said, at times adversity is necessary for us to grow. Adversity helps us to rise to the challenge. Uncovering abilities hidden within us without the pain, these abilities would not have stayed hidden. We had in our class, teaching the class, it says, pain is an antidote to what? Denial. See, pain exposes the junk that we're not dealing with. Two, adversity deepens our relationships. give you an explanation next time on that, but I'm going to give you three. Adversity changes our view about what really matters. And four, adversity points us to a hope beyond ourselves. Repeat them again. Adversity helps us rise to the challenge, uncovering abilities hidden within us without the pain these abilities would have stayed hidden. So it has a purpose, don't you think? So if you're going through stuff right now in life, knowing that it is because it's exposing stuff that you need to deal with, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Two, adversity deepens our relationships. So it's about learning and growing 
and understanding the grief behind stuff sometimes. Three, adversity changes. Turn to someone says, changes our view about what really matters. If we face an adversity and we want to go back to where we were before, then you don't grow. And a lot of times we want to go back to what we had when you're not meant to. You're meant to grow. And we just still want to go back to what we're comfortable with. Think about when Jesus walked the disciples. He didn't want them to be the same. When Jesus was about to ascend, and he ascended, well, before when he died, before his ascension, what the first disciples went right back to what? They went back to fishing, what they were used to doing when he called them. The tendency is that we go right back to what we're comfortable with. When we're not meant to go back. If you're going through an adversity, it's because you're meant to be transformed, to grow, to change. And four, adversity points us to a hope beyond ourselves. Let's focus on being unified. Let's bow our heads right now. Father, we thank you. So often, Lord, we, we want to do your will. We want to see your hand at work. We want to do what you call us to do. We want to be faithful, Lord. And sometimes it's so difficult, Lord. Sometimes we don't know how to get started. So we're going to ask today, Lord, as we pray, that you help us to fulfill our mission the mission you left behind for us to finish. You said that we are meant to be the light of the world. We know that darkness cannot even comprehend light. And if we are meant to be a light, Lord, we're meant to shine as you did. We need to know you. So, Father, help us to see things through your eyes and not our own. Give us the courage and strength, Lord, to find our purpose, that thing that we're meant to do that no one else can. We're going to ask you today to search our hearts. We're going to come before you today asking you to prepare us, Lord. Help us to see things differently. Help us to move forward. I pray for your blessing upon each one that's here and hearing this message. I ask you to give us new insight. I ask you to open their eyes to see the truth, that truth that will set them free. Let them make a difference in the world around them today. Let them focus on being united in this body of believers to be the body of Christ. You said that we are a people, a holy people, a people belonging to you, a holy nation. Father, let us experience that power of your word and unity. We thank you for this victory today. In Jesus' name. Amen.